Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Rochelle. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you, and I hope you are too. I am, thank you so much. And thank you again for agreeing to chat with me today. I often have to explain to people, people think when I the name the name of these things are diversity chats that we're going to talk about diversity, but that's usually the least thing that we talk about. We talk more about the journey from point A to point B. So I'm going to start by asking you to please tell us your name. My full name, I'm originally from Brazil, and my name is completely Portuguese. So it is Carla. I'm I'm pronouncing how it is. Carla Maria Pedrosa Ribeiro. Or to make it easier, you can just call me Carla Ribeiro. <laughs> and that's Dr. Carla yes. Ribeiro. Yes. <laughs> yeah, make sure we get that in there. So uh, Dr. Ribeiro, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us a little bit, anything you feel comfortable sharing about your journey, your career, your, your life, anything you wish to share? Yeah, you know, I've been in the United States for almost 40 years, even though I, I still have my Brazilian Portuguese accent. Um, so back in the early 80s, um, I was in medical school in Brazil. In Brazil, we don't have college uh, degrees. We go straight from the equivalent to high school to medical school, if you will. But medical school also lasts longer, six years. Mm -hmm. And um, I started getting involved in research. In, in those days, it was uh, renal oriented research. Uh, even though in the university I was, we did not have so many opportunities or conditions to do everything, but I had fantastic mentors. And uh, due to my early exposure, um, one of them actually, his name is Carlos Perez da Costa. Um, he made a connection for me at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Um, and in which I got in touch with Ben, the chief of the renal section. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there on, he accepted me to just go as a visiting medical student. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just fell in love with the, of course, I was in a completely different world where, you know, top notch research was being conducted. And uh, I was given ample opportunities to, to, to learn. Uh, my, my boss, again, the chief of the renal section, his name is Wadi Suki, Dr. Wadi Suki. He was wonderful for me. He even came to the point of teaching me how to go about different aspects of the technique that I learned. But then I had to go back to Brazil uh, to restart my medical school. And then, um, Unfortunately, a few weeks after I, I went back, this was 1982, um, they started the, all the federal universities in which I, mine was one of them, my state, they started a big strike and I, I lost completely the entire semester. At the same time, I also had my boyfriend who was in Baylor, he also was from my hometown. We, you know, we've met a long time ago. We were like kids, teenagers when we met. And so we decided to get married. He went to Brazil, um, we got married, and then we went back to Houston. So then in the very early uh, 80s, if you will, 83 or so, when we went back to Houston, I learned a lot more. I, I went back to the same laboratory, and this is what made a big difference for me because um, I was able to, to work semi-independently. Um, I had a lot of mentoring from my, again, my boss. He would send me to meetings, to all kinds of you know, special conferences in which I would present my work, just like anybody else. And so in one of the um, meetings, the American Society of Nephrology meeting, which is like the top meeting, if you will, annual meeting for the area, I've met then um, the person who would become extremely instrumental in my life. And uh, his name was Lazaro Mendel, Dr. Lazaro Mendel from Duke University. And uh, Dr. Lazaro Mendel was also someone working with renal physiology, renal metabolism. So he came to my poster and we met. And so I presented my work for him. And I, at that time, I was already telling him that we were, then my husband and I, 
we were considering moving to North Carolina. And so one thing led to another and uh, he basically, my then prospective advisor, Lazar Mendel, told me, why don't you apply to graduate school? The caveat is that I did not have a college degree because in Brazil, we don't have that. Nor I had then already, um, how can I say, um, I graduated from medical school because I had taken a leave of absence to do all this. But I want to do science. I want to do research. That's what I, I, I fell in love for. So um, I, I took the GIE. I applied for graduate school. I was accepted at Duke University. And of course, even though I met other professors, but Dr. Lazo Mendel was the person I want to work with. So uh, the five years that I spent there in his lab, I could very easily say, I can very easily say that they were perhaps the best years of my life in regards to research science, because not only he taught me a lot, but he also gave me a lot of freedom to develop my work. And one of the things that I've learned from him, and until this day, I repeat to people I mentor or to colleagues, to youngsters, if you will, was that Carla, okay, I want you to be in my lab as a graduate student. However, do not expect me to give you, let's say, a book that you have just to open and follow the protocols for your thesis work. I want you to come out with your own ideas. And then I looked at his face and I said, Les, that's how we called each other. Everybody called him Les, short for Lazaro. Les, we have a deal. And so he said to me, you need to understand that this is the time that you need to start thinking on your own. Of course, as your mentor, I will, I will help you throughout the entire process. But I want you to start developing your own ideas because as you leave my lab, after you graduate, you go to a postdoctoral, which is usually what happens in our area. Um, you're gonna be expected more and more and more to come out with your own ideas, your own projects. In other words, to go through the path towards independence. And so this was extremely important for me and I took it seriously. And so uh, it worked wonderfully. Um, after I finished my graduate school at Duke, in 1992. So in 1993, I moved to locally, all local here, um, to NIHS, where I did a five-year postdoctoral in the laboratory of Dr. James Putney, who also is a friend of mine. We became friends even before that. Uh, he was actually my thesis committee um, in the he also was a wonderful mentor. Once more, I was able to bring into the lab, into the projects, my own ideas to develop things that he was not necessarily uh, working from a primary point of view. So what I'm saying is that I was very lucky to have people who allowed me, who did not impose their you know, preconceived ideas, if you will, and I just had to follow the protocol without learning from scratch, without, you know. And then after I finished my postdoctoral, I came to UNC Chapel Hill in 1998. And until this day, I'm here. So I came, uh, I joined the Cystic Fibrosis Center, who already in those days was, and still is, directed by Dr. Richard Boucher. And uh, I, I basically applied the concepts I have learned during graduate school, the concepts I have learned during my postdoctoral, and then I applied these concepts to fundamental questions of cellular biology, uh, calcium signaling, if you will, for cystic fibrosis. And this is basically how I launched my career in the area, and I became a pulmonary biologist. Well, it sounds like a wonderful journey. Uh, very, very filled with, with lots of successes and opportunities to uh, to go where your your desire wanted to take you. So that's really wonderful. So let me ask you this: 
Um, what was the transition from Brazil to America like? Was that hard for you or did you do it naturally? It just, it just came easily to you. Well, I would say easy, <clears throat> it was not because from a cultural point of view, you know, Brazilians are not, <clears throat> excuse me, necessarily so different than Americans. I mean, we are Western oriented society, um, but within that context, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, we do have, of course, differences. You know, for example, Brazilians are much more easygoing. They, they, you meet them the first time around, and they're like kiss you <laughs> two eyes three times sometimes. And uh, here, I've learned on the, on the early days that you are introduce someone in a party, someone I've never met. You shake your hands. You don't just bring the person kiss. You know. Um, uh, since, for example, you invite me for a party, um, a dinner, uh, and sometimes the invitations would explicitly say from 8 to 11 or from whatever, if it is a holiday party, from 8 to midnight. I'm like, how can, they're telling us that we should leave after in the time you know, it comes, you know? In Brazil, we don't have that. We usually, you know, we have a party, we invite people and they stay as long as they want. However, as you start, absorbing, assimilating the culture or the nuances of the American culture. I speak for myself. I start to say, this makes so much sense. How many times, for example, you'd have, you know, guests that would never leave your home and you are like at the end of the night, you know, kind of like very tired. Anyway, um, and it, it eventually came to a point that I used to laugh because, you know, here, even here in Chapel Hill, when we moved here, um, that, um, I would have a party, I would go to a party with a whole bunch of Brazilians, you know, and without even knowing some of them, but based on the conversation that I was listening, you know, from them, I could tell this person is just here for a few months only, this person is here for, because you, you change, you know, all of a sudden you start to appreciate, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Um, to me, the hardest thing really was, of course, leaving my family, you know, uh, I left everything that I knew that I had. Um, as I said, I came with then my husband. And eventually, years later, we divorced. But um, we we were very close to the families. And so the family, they, they, they've been so distant. And, you know, you have also to keep in mind that those were the days that we did not even have internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> To make a phone call was quite expensive, you know, to spend several minutes. So nowadays people take for granted, you know, you have WhatsApp, you have this, you have that, everything you can pay for, and you can have a video. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, especially now, I mean, 40 years almost, um, in 2023, it will be exactly 40 years since I've moved permanently to the U.S., so I can say that I have lived far longer here than in Brazil. And, uh, and here is my country, you know, that I have obviously embraced. And uh, sometimes I even, you know, make a joke saying to my American, native American, you know, friends, you are an American because you were born here. I am an American because I chose to. <laughs> I like it. That's very <laughs> nice. So, so do you get to go home and see your family? Uh, oh yeah, you usually. Yes, usually I go once a year, um, excepting for the last two years because of COVID. My mom, you know, she's ninety now, and I don't want her to. Now, of course, everybody's vaccinated there. So am I here? I already got my booster, so I'm planning if all goes well to go early next year. That's excellent. And so you said you and your husband divorced. Are you still maintain relationships? Are you close? Do you two get together? Do you have kids well, together? We, yeah, we, we, we used to because, you know, we, we were very, I mean, he was a major part of my life and uh, I cannot deny he was extremely um, instrumental for, you know, opening my eyes to science. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if it were not because of him, I would have not followed this career. I, would, I could have been always in Brazil. I would have become a medical doctor, you know, and have a completely different, 
different life. But going back to your question, unfortunately, he passed away this year. Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. So I, the reason why I asked the question was because it sounded like the two of you came here together and it was really your closest ally here. Exactly. This, is, this is what my mom always used to say. My mother liked him a lot. Um, and, you know, it's true because, you know, the other thing is that talking about the culture back in Brazil, <clears throat> especially where we come from, because we were from the same hometown, same everything. So we could speak about things that him and I understand fully, you know, maybe perhaps even another person from Brazil but from a completely different region. It's just like United States. You have so many different cultures or subcultures, if you will, different food, different ethnicities. <clears throat> and uh, so, yes, we always, you know, could, we, would, we know that we had that channel on each other yeah. to, to discuss things or even compare things, you know, yeah. but. So, so let me ask you this, going to medicine. So you knew very early on in your life that you wanted to be in medicine or science at some point, yes? Well, that's the other in interesting issue. Once more, back in Brazil, because we don't have college. Yeah. So we are so young when we have to decide what I'm gonna do if I'm gonna go to a higher, you know, achieve a higher degree, if you will, uh, education. So I was approximately 14 years old when I took a vocational test uh, with a psychologist friend of ours and um, you know she said oh um, the primary uh, the result was primarily pointing that you should be a lawyer mm -hmm. and I, I heard that from several people you know when I used to fight with my then husband he used to say you should have been a prosecutor you know <laughs> then the second option was oh uh, you can also be a very good architect. I'm like, what about medical school, which was already in my mind? Oh, but you can be in medical school too. And I'm like, what kind of vocational test is that? I can be anything. But anyway, but obviously I chose medical school. So when uh, we start medical school, again, going straight from high school, you have to do a big test of four days. And so it's basically you are accepted there based on scores solely. Mm -hmm. Unlike here, that you have so many components, you have intro kids, you have these and that. We don't have that in there. So um, I, I was 18 when I started medical school, which was the normal average age. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my colleagues, for example, was 16. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these are kids, you know what I mean? So. But this is what it is. And a lot of times you are basically, yeah, you are forced so young to choose what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Obviously, some people drop. Some people even graduate, but they realize this is not for me and I want to do something else. But, but that's how it is in Brazil. Yeah. So I was quite young when I got into medical school. And so, so you came to America and you found out that typically students go to undergraduate and then eventually uh, apply for medical school or, or, or some process like that. Was that challenging for you to move from where you, the way you had learned and where, the way schools are structured in Brazil to how they are here? Or was that an easy transition as well? Well, I would say neither. Of course, it was different, first and foremost. But as I started to become more and more aware of how the educational system, you know, if you want to follow a higher career, if you in terms of a degree, um, I believe it's completely correct here. I, you know, eventually I kept saying, it's not right how it is in Brazil, because again, we are so immature, you know, when we get, I mean, if you want to become an engineer, if you want to become an architect, anything that needs a higher degree, let alone medical school, we are young and we don't really know a lot yet, even a lot about life. Um, here, because you get into medical school at the very least at 22, 23, sometimes even older age, you have time to absorb more about yourself, to learn more about life and to also get more experiences. Um, so I think the system here is far better. No questions to me. Yeah. 
So let me ask you this question. So it, with, with COVID, we have heard so much uh, about this, this virus and, and how it manufacture, manufactures itself and then mutates and all those other kinds of pieces and parts. But one of the, the interesting narratives in the COVID is how it affects black and brown communities, marginalized people. Do you think that that is in our genes or do you think that there is more of an environmental uh, uh, evolution, if you will, for, that makes um, communities who have not necessarily been uh, able to have all the resources and access to resources uh, susceptible to this disease in a greater way than others? So first and foremost, Rochelle, I, I, I hope you, you don't mind me referring to you as Rochelle, but you are also a doctor. Um, I want to make a disclaimer here uh, that I do not work with COVID, even though a lot of my colleagues here do. I'm just asking your opinion. No, I understand, I understand. But um, my general understanding is that, especially as we started having um, the vaccinations and things like that, um, a lot of the uh, underserved, uh, specifically black community, uh, uh, was very, was not trusting the notion that they should go ahead and get vaccinated. Still are not trusting. Huh? Still not trusting. It's still you not still trusting. Right. And I have to say, of course, this uh, is uh, something that I, I, I worry a lot for obvious reasons. I wish everybody who could get access, and we all have access to a certain extent to these vaccines, should get them immediately. But then you have to think about too. I mean, some people are older; they 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 live in certain areas that are, you know, not so easy to access medical care. They are basically underserved, and but these are all uh, factors that will, without any questions, contribute to, you know, the black community not being as well vaccinated as they should, and I hope they will. Uh, so. Bottom line is, regardless of the genetic issue, which I don't think there is, I know of one that would put the black people, the black community at a disadvantage, if you will. I think primarily is the issue of they need to be uh, perhaps better educated for the, the importance of the vaccines. They need to be given the conditions that they can have free access in whatever ways that there is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is how I, I see so, it. Probably. So I, I, want, I want to just, just point out something to you. So all the research studies that I have seen to date to say this is uh, within black and brown communities, the higher level of real sickness happens I mean, among black and brown, not just black. But there was also an article that was uh, put out by the Washington Post that said that what black and brown or minority communities had in common was that Republicans were also resistant to taking the vaccine. And for, and I'm not gonna speak for brown communities because it's not my community, but for black communities, historically white traditional medicine has done so many harms to us mm -hmm. that to rush out and get a vaccine that there's so much unknown about it. And even today, you know, when they first talked about the vaccine, you know, once you get this vaccine, you won't, won't get COVID or you have a much lesser chance to get COVID. Well, we have breakthrough cases. We have, you know, different people coming out, different things. So now we're going to have a booster and a booster and a booster and a booster. All this information comes out. And even as a, I consider myself a well-read, educated person, I struggle to make sense of it. And, and, and if you're in a community where information about healthcare is not necessarily, you know, reliable, you know, clear and in plain English, but in more languages that doesn't make sense to the average person, it's hard to see why people would be rushing to get a vaccine or being interested in participating fully in this process. Do you see any logic to that? I completely see a logic to that. I mean, I think there are several compounding factors. It's not just one factor isolated. It is a collection of factors that are antagonistic to the net effect, which is everybody should get vaccinated. But like you have alluded uh, uh, earlier, uh, the issue of the black community who has been mistreated by previously, by 
you know, the medical community. Um, and we don't have to go in details what happened, but we all know this is a major issue because it, it, it led to the point that they, they, they lost their trust. And it's very hard. When you lose trust, it's very hard to recover it. Number one. Number two, uh, we all have to remember, even though it seems like so long ago, but the whole year, last year, when COVID started, the amount of misinformation, which is still nowadays, but how the previous administration was carrying on their measures, or lack of them, by the way, uh, their uh, uh, conferences, you know, it was very confusing. Uh, people being told that, you know, maybe they should use a light, maybe they should consider Clorox, you know, stuff like that. The whole thing was extremely difficult. Um, and to me, as a scientist, who is a pulmonary biologist, who is surrounded by medical doctors right here across from me, uh, taking care of patients, including COVID patients, um, it was unimaginable that we are in the United States, is still the richest country in the world with all this technology, with all the resources we have available and people were not getting the message loud and clear. All the, the hoaxes going out there, you know, uh, of course the big contribution of the internet, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, you name it. Um, to basically deny what the scientists were saying. Uh, people like Dr. Anthony Fauci, you know, whom I have high respect for, being almost like prosecuted, if you will, by, by groups, you know, and having threats because simply he wanted to do his job and save lives. To me, this is unimaginable. And so all together, previous historical events involving the medical community and the black community. Um, the vast amounts of, um, of misinformation. And, uh, and some of them were actually clearly trying to seed as much doubt as they could so people would not get the vaccines. Um, and remarkably, and not much has changed from then to now, even with a new administration and with uh, more reasonable uh, information coming out about the vaccine, you know, like it's, it's still a lot of misinformation. And even if you were to pay close attention to it, it's a lot. And the reason why I'm asking you this is not about COVID or anything else, but like more about healthcare as a whole. So, you know, like, first of all, you know, I worked in a law school for a long time and people often complain lawyers do not speak plain English. They speak law legalese and medicine does the same thing. You know, they tell you about a thing. So I went to the doctor and the doctor said something to me and he says, um, I think you have the early stages of CKD. What is that? <laughs> You know, like, so you have to go Google it or they provide you your test results. You have to go Google it. What does this mean? And so for the patient, especially patients who are not well educated or well experienced with medicine, this is a kind of, you know, well, I won't do anything because I don't know what this means. And, 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 and I think that in, in a large measure, one of the great things about you and people like you is when you get black and brown and red and and other groups into medicine, you get a different narrative that maybe other people can relate to. I told everybody I could tell, if you want black people to get the vaccine, go into those communities and have black people talking about this. If you're gonna put a white man on television to talk about a vaccine in a black community, it's a wash. It's, it's just almost not anything is gonna happen. So, you know, they did do some of that. I saw that they, you know, they had John Legend singing about it. And then they had doctors, local doctors talking about it. But, but medicine as a whole has been so white and male that the success and well-being of those that were not white and male, including white females, was often so suspect. And so now that there is coming more diversity in medicine and more opportunities for people who are coming into medicine to speak in a language that patients understand. So you have a blood test. Somebody sends you the results of your blood test and there are all these acronyms or letters or something. And then there's some numbers followed by it. 
you know, I can't tell you how often somebody comes to me and says, what does this mean? And they think I can interpret it because I'm a technologist. Those numbers are as foreign to me as they are to them. And so what I hope is that with coming time, science will matter to everyone and not just to a few. Like people don't believe we have climate problems because they don't trust science. They don't believe in the virus and what we're trying to do because they don't trust science. And so, so much about science has been made to be the butt of what's wrong with our healthcare system. And a part of it belongs to medicine itself. It, it deserves some of that, that, whatever it is that people think about it. How do you think you and people like you will change that? Rochelle, first and foremost, I totally agree with what you have said. Um, it's not just medicine as we know it, but also even science as a scientist, we need to be able to translate what we do. What kind of benefits perhaps my research, my everyday research in the lab will bring to you, to your family, to your friends, uh, but not with extraneous, difficult language, but to a everyday man's layperson language that they can understand precisely as much as possible what we're doing. Um, but the other problem too that I think is, um, let's face it, it takes generations to change, right? Uh, whatever. So if we don't start paying more attention to science, technology, mass, and of course medicine down the road, from the very early days in school, yeah. and to be able to teach all, not a small group of privileged people, right? Who can pay perhaps, you know, private schools, the schools that other people, including blacks and browns, you know, cannot come and, and be part of it, this situation will continue to occur. Yeah. Um, obviously, I always say that from my perspective, sometimes I even joke to my friends, you know, if you will, my colleagues, that I'm a double minority because I'm a woman. And at the same time, I'm also for American purposes. I'm considered Hispanic, even though I think it's interesting because <laughs> In Brazil, we speak Portuguese. We don't even speak Spanish. Of course, some of us can speak Spanish, but you know. But anyway, um, I cannot deny to you, back to my early days in the United States, when I came here, my, my medical school, my class of medical school was primarily composed of 120 students. This is like the average every semester. Um, almost roughly of it were females. I'm talking about 1978. So when I came to Houston, the first time as a um, visitor, medical student, you know, visiting medical student, and I became, you know, I got to know some students, medical students from Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I realized that there were very few women those days who were medical students. I'm like, what? And I just could not comprehend that because I thought, well, if this is in Brazil, in the United States should be even wow, you know. Yeah. And that continued to occur. Um, so, uh, like I said, I, I don't want to go into details, but I did have some rough times too. I don't want you to think that um, my coming to the United States was perfect and I only had wonderful things happen to me. No. I had a lot of wonderful things happening to me, but I also had very concerning situations, yeah. which clearly nowadays I, I would have stamped as maybe racism and or at the very least microaggressions. Absolutely. Um, Sexism, I, you know, oh yeah. any, any, no, any, any of those kinds of things. I, I, I did not think that your, your, your path to where you are now was a cakewalk. I am sure you had some pitfalls and some ups and downs and all of that stuff. I think we all do. And so if you can imagine, you know, as uh, as you've been deemed a Hispanic woman, which I don't think that's what you are. That's why I refer to people as at least something that you can identify, like so black and brown and white and red and whatever. But 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 even that that you have this this thing attached to you that says what you are affects how you are able to provide your craft. So as a black woman in technology, 
I am always the least experienced, always challenged, always having to fight to prove I know what I know. And it gets to be tiresome to be constantly proving yourself over and over and over again. Um, you're completely right. Again, uh, I, I have gone through situations like that several times, you know, also because, again, being a double minority. Uh, and I sometimes also have to wonder that the, the people surround me, if you will, uh, from whom I've got microaggressions or simply disregards, if you will. Yep. Uh, sometimes they don't even realize they're doing that because it has been so much incorporated into their preconceived ideas, you know, that, you know, um, for example, being in a meeting with a whole bunch of guys and I will give a, an opinion. And then that opinion is not even perhaps considered by who is running the meeting. But then five minutes later, one of the guys says the same. It just was a slight different twist, if you will. Oh, wow, this is a great idea. Things like that. So um, we call that he peaked. <laughs> he peaked, not repeat, but he peaked. A woman says it, it's a phenomenal idea, crickets. The minute a man rephrases it, oh my God, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> he peaked. You know, it's like, give me a break. You know, that I, because... I also I also understand that, of course, you know, things have changed a little bit. A little. But me, Not much. A little. Um, yeah, exactly. A little. So, uh, to me, I have been involved in situations where I've been very outspoken. And uh, even my some of my colleagues know that they say, Carla, you are not just doing that for yourself, but for us all. Yes. If it is from a woman's perspective, if it is from a minority, from the point of view of you know, your ethnicity, which, like I said, this is one of the reasons among several why I decided to get involved here at UNC in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and also I decided to participate on the PROMISE study um, because I, this issue is very dear to my heart. I've been there, I've done that, even though coming from a different perspective, I'm not saying everybody, you know, should be put in the same basket. No, everybody comes with his or her own um, background, if you will. But then there are some common problems or common principles, if you will, that can be applicable to all. Yes. And in my view, uh, it takes individuals, as well as groups, and eventually a major number of people to get together with the mission of inclusion, diversity, equity, because we have to. There is no way out. But, 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 but let me say, say, say a couple of things to you first. So first of all, we accept. So all of these microaggressions and all these behaviors that happen, we don't push back against them. Usually we just roll with them because we're trying to grow our career. We're trying to stay employed, whatever it is. We just, so we accept them. And I think what's really interesting about the younger generation is they're not accepting it. I heard uh, uh, someone, something on TikTok where one person said, if they don't have black and brown people in the characters, I'm not watching the television show. Or if the commercial is aimed at just you know white people, I'm not buying the product. I think that's a real good step forward for people to, to do. But there are so many things that we have. So, for example, there's a new term out there, and I shouldn't say it's new. It's been around for a couple of years. It's called people of color. Mm -hmm. I wonder what what is a person of color? Where did no. this come from? So often I do. When I, so I, I have a business. I do. A, I have a, a, a diversity business. So I work with companies and individuals to understand these things. So one of these talks I was giving. I, I got my box of crayons. I bought eight, a box of eight. I didn't bring the one that has 385 crayons in it. I just bought the one that had eight. And I just laid them out. And there was a black crayon. There was a brown crayon. There was a red crayon. There was a yellow crayon. There was a green crayon. And there was a white crayon. So if people are co of color, and color, whatever color might mean, is white not a color? So I don't allow people to refer to me or talk to me about people of color because it means that white people can then further separate themselves from others. We Rochelle. are all people. Rochelle, thank yes. you very much for bringing this issue because I have the same feeling or better saying the same uh, opinion too. Uh, going back to Brazil, I'm not saying Brazil, there is no race, racism in Brazil. I'm not denying that, but I'm just giving my specific example. When I was in medical school, again, 
120 students in my class. And then oh, people make uh, friendships, subgroups, whatever. So I had a, a huge group of you know, students who after class, weekends, you know, we'd go out together, we'd have parties, whatever. Until I came to the United States, that's when I all of a sudden like, oh my God, we've never back in Brazil referred to our medical students or whatever students, you know, colleagues as that Jewish person, that black person, that Chinese person. First of all, we called them by their first names. Right. Uh, and I only became aware of who was, for example, Jewish in my medical school class because since we, I was friends with them, yeah. one of them, you know, we, we have this big uh, Jewish center in my hometown. And so she had access. And so she reserved the pool in one afternoon for our group, a large group of you know, students to just you know, have a good time there. Yeah. And so I knew, oh, she's Jewish. Until then, I had no idea, you know, this notion of classifying people so much and having to refer to them by their ethnicity, by their... So you become aware, when you come to this country, you become so aware Absolutely. of this, which to me was going back to the culture thing that you were talking earlier, uh, was like a eye-opening. Yeah. And I yeah. hate these people of color thing too. Yeah, this is Seg segmenting people allows those who wish to to categorize people as something another. So if you are, as you said, we are double minorities. Okay, so what what exactly did that mean back in the day in the sixties and seventies? It just means the federal government had a mandate that you had to have a minority, and then if you got a double minority, you got a big check. You know what? And so that was how that process works. But you know. The reason why, you know, so when, when I left Duke, uh, I did not want to go out and find another job. And people have offered me jobs uh, left and right. And that's very sweet. Thank you. Keep offering them. Maybe I'll accept one one day. But my work is in this, this field. And I have this analogy that I tell people all the time, you know, what white privilege is. So if, if you can imagine winning the lottery, right? You win the lottery for three or four hundred million dollars. And all of a sudden, all your cousins and friends and colleagues from everywhere come and they want some of it. They want some of your lottery winnings. The nature of who we are, right? People, self-preservation, right? So I've got to keep it for myself. I've got, you know, my family, my, you know, I've got to keep it. And then these people who are clamoring at your door who wants this, this, these funds that you have becomes a challenge for you. Because even if you're a decent, non-racist, fair, equitable person, you still have this process of, well, what is it that I know you're going to do if I give you some of my funds? Are you going to treat it well? Are you going to use it to your advantage? Are you going to keep coming back to me for more? So privilege for white people is in that lens of giving a little bit at a time for a little bit of sort of short period of time. And then you don't have that. You have to keep going back for more privilege. You have to keep going back. So when you were talking about it in the meeting and I was telling you about he peed, that's privilege, right? So the person who's running the meeting, all the other people, privilege. And they gave you a little bit of privilege to speak, but they didn't give you the privilege to have your idea fully vetted, right? So that's that privilege. And so in, in our society, what I'm hoping is, is right now more women are going to college than men and graduating with degrees of all ethnicities. All women are just doing amazing things. So I hope that's the case. I hope companies stop doing the DEI talk. You know, it's easy to talk about this. And when Mr. Floyd was killed, it was just easy. So people talk, talk, talk. What are you doing? So you hire, you promote, you include, you give people a voice, a seat at the table, you give people an opportunity to participate, show what they're made of, as opposed to talking about it. So UNC, Duke, wherever you are, these predominantly white institutions are predominantly white and male in the leadership. Mm -hmm. predominantly white male in the second level of military. So you have to get down to like next to lower level of management before you get any real color. And yet still they invite black and brown and other students to school and do not create methods for them to grow and for them to feel like they're a part of the community. If you are really serious about DEI, it is not talking unless it is giving context, right? So oh, I totally agree with you. I mean, already when I was in graduate school, I mean, these conversations were coming out, you know, that of the glass ceiling, right? Yeah. 
uh, regardless of color, if you will. Uh, I mean, how many women were graduating, were in, in graduate schools or whatever, you know, departments, if you will, uh, or better thing, fields. And as you go on, up, 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 it is really a pyramid and they disappear from the, from right. the view, you know? Uh, and the same is true for, again, minorities, which include women, but also Blacks, Hispanics, or else. Um, if you give them the opportunity, but then you don't follow up, there will be some kind of glass ceiling similarly that they won't perhaps be able to progress. So again, the DEI you know, type of uh, uh, concerns and uh, programs, I am totally for, because that's how we start. We need to talk first and foremost, we need to understand. But, but if we stay that, just but, there. But, but, but talking, you know, and I heard this from a gentleman this morning, talking for people who think they already know, is a waste of time. So people who think, well, we already know the race problem exists. We already know the gender problem exists. We already know the age what, problem what I'm exists. Talking about already, talking right. is so, so, not, so not for the people for right. whom that's, you want to include. Right. It's that's, for that's the not. institutions right. that you, need you, to change and to be unequivocally inclusive, promote equity, diversity, and know how that can be implemented. And right. so people like me and so many others can do things in the sense, going back to the, your original question, being committees for hire, you know, being committees that can perhaps change the guidelines of the institutions, you know, at, at least at, at the very least, this is what we can do here. And, uh, and of course, being able to embrace the new coming minorities under representative people in ways that they feel that they are nurtured, that right. they are welcome, that they belong, and they have all similarly to anybody else, all the conditions to thrive. Okay. In other words, to just say, oh yeah, 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 we accept you, come, 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 come and do nothing. This, I mean, this but that's what we're still doing. We're still doing that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. look, there is a long way to go. Long way to go. But I must say, again, being you know in science for 40 years now, um, I see changes that I do embrace, but I can only hope that they will be indeed uh, fundamental changes that can make an impact. Yeah. Like as I say, that will change the narrative. Absolutely. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, we have used up all of our time, but I want to give you an opportunity to say anything that you may want to say that we did not cover. So please. Uh, no, I, I basically, first and foremost, I want to thank you also for giving me the opportunity to express some of my ideas, to talk a little bit about my journey. And, uh, and uh, once more, uh, your concerns that we have you know, discussed are also mine. Uh, they, they are issues that I care a lot about. And uh, I can only hope that with changes, um, things that I and others can do a, a, throughout this country, in the university level, at company levels and so on, that can indeed be implemented and uh, you know, few years, maybe a generation from now. We can look back and see finally we are seeing some positive changes. Absolutely. That's what I hope for. I, I hope for too. I, I, I agree that we have to do something different than what we're doing now if we're ever going to see any real change. But thank you again so much for agreeing to chat with me. I will send you a link to this video. Please watch it once I do and let me know if I may upload it and subscribe to my channel and oh, ask I did already. <laughs> and ask others to to join join yes. me chat with me. Please ask others that will want to share or talk with me to talk with me and uh, come back. Come back and talk to me again. We can have a follow up conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Thank I appreciate you. the opportunity. Thank you so much. Have Thank a great you. rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.